So first, let me introduce our speakers today. Geo Bush is a staff attorney with Legal Services of North Florida. He received his undergraduate degree from the University of South Florida and law degree from Florida State University College of Law. While in law school, Geo served as editor-in-chief for the Journal of Transnational Law and Policy and was a member of the Florida State College of Law Moot Court team. Additionally, he served as a judicial intern for the Honorable George S. S. Reynolds of the Second Judicial Circuit of Florida and received the Distinguished Pro Bono Service Award for his commitment to those who cannot afford legal services. He also served as a student ambassador for the law school and was privileged to attend the Florida State University Law Conference at Oxford University. Following his graduation from law school, Giovanni interned for the International Bar Association's Human Rights Institute in London, England. Currently, GEO, besides working as a staff attorney at Legal Services of North Florida, is an adjunct professor at FSU College of Law. Mary Rose Whitehouse is a Tallahassee, Florida native with over five years of experience in legal services with a special emphasis on housing justice. Through her work as a staff attorney at Legal Services of North Florida, Mary Rose has become attuned to the national trend of the displacement of whole mobile home communities. Prior to joining Legal Services in North Florida, Mary Rose was a staff attorney at Florida Legal Services. She's a graduate of Loyola University, New Orleans College of Law, where she clerked at Southeast Louisiana Legal Services. So thank you, Gio and Mary Rose, for coming today, and you can take it over now. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining us. We're very excited to be here. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, so, oops, I think I just clicked back a little bit. There we go. Um, so why is it important to have a segment on mobile homes and elder justice? Um, many of our clients who live in mobile homes are senior citizens, um, and mobile homes are generally viewed as a more affordable housing option for renters and for homeowners alike. Um, but actually, the Census Bureau's American Community Survey shows that older adults living in mobile homes are as housing cost burden as their peers who live in other forms of housing. Uh, and then likewise, older adults renting mobile homes pay a similar share of their income to housing costs um, as renters residing in other forms of housing. Um, so we just have a little, a couple of statistics here, a little over 3 million adults ages 16 older living in mobile homes throughout the country, uh, and then Florida is second in the country in terms of its number of mobile homes, um, seconded, or I'm sorry, preceded only by Texas. Um, and then I just had some information here um, regarding COVID. Um, older adults in mobile homes were more likely to report being diagnosed with COVID than older adults living in other housing settings extrapolating, I imagine it's because um, it's a congregate setting. Um, and then similarly, older adults in mobile homes were more likely to report a loss of employment income over a four week period, period than older adults living in other housing settings. Um, so we're going to review two different case studies from our experience representing clients who live in mobile home parks uh, here in our service area. Uh, the first case study deals with when the Florida Mobile Home Act applies, and then the second case study is about what happens when the Mobile Home Act does not apply, uh, and instead Florida's Landlord-Tenant Act will govern. Um, so first, we're just going to give you a brief overview of the law. Uh, we promise we won't get too in the nitty gritty because we know we have um, different, you know, advocates from, from all backgrounds and not just lawyers present. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and dive into some case studies. Um, so just a brief note about the Mobile Home Act, which is Chapter 723 of Florida Statutes. Um, and I thought it was interesting about why it was created. Um, the legislature um, said it was intent was, um, the quote is, once occupancy has commenced, unique factors can affect the bargaining position of the parties and can affect the operation of market forces. Because of those unique factors, there exists inherently real and substantial differences in the relationships which distinguish it from other landlord-tenant relationships. Uh, the legislature recognizes that mobile homeowners have basic property and other rights which must be protected. So that's just a little bit of the history um, behind why the uh, Mobile Home Act was passed. 
um, and how it's distinct from Chapter 83, which Gio is going to discuss uh, later on in the presentation. Um, so when does 723, the Mobile Home Act, apply? So there are kind of three factors that you're going to want to look to. First, uh, does your client own the mobile home? Um, does your client uh, own the mobile home and rent the lot on which the mobile home sits? And then finally, are there at least 10 or more other mobile home owners in the park? Um, if all of those factors are met, then the Florida uh, Mobile Home Act likely applies. Um, and it's really important to make this determination because 723 um, provides some additional uh, protections that the Florida Landlord and Tenant Act does not provide. Um, and we'll discuss that in uh, a little bit more uh, later on. Um, so one thing about, I think, really the hallmark of Chapter 723 um, is this, um, you know, um, enumeration of residents' abilities to um, form either mobile home associations or mobile home committees. Um, they're distinct. Uh, an association has to be set up as a corporation, and you have to have at least uh, two-thirds of homeowners in the park to agree in writing to become a member. Um, something that can be a little bit quicker if you're kind of in a bind is uh, forming a homeowners committee. Um, and that's easier because you don't have to incorporate and it uh, just requires two thirds of homeowners to consent to let the committee of homeowners represent the uh, homeowners interests at large. Um, and typically the committee is made up of five or less people. Um, let's see, and, and this is just, again, they have an inherent right to assemble and communicate with other homeowners or tenants and they can meet in any kind of common area um, at the mobile home park or you know, in the home of one of the residents. Um, and I think a really important factor here is this, again, kind of what the legislature uh, spoke about was uh, uh, this collective bargaining power um, and that if a mobile home park owner decides to sell, they must notify um, the homeowners and uh, the homeowners association in advance and actually give them that uh, right of first refusal to purchase the property. And there's been um, some wonderful national cases where we've seen um, associations come together and actually get that capital to go ahead and purchase the park, which is pretty wonderful. Um, so what kind of protections you know, can a committee or an association provide? Um, again, going back to that collective bargaining, um, I would say one of the main benefits is the ability to negotiate when the park owner is trying to raise the rent. Um, park owners must give a 90 day notice of rent increase. Um, and then at that point, the association or committee um, has the ability to first request an informal meeting with the park owners to um, discuss, you know, uh, what factors are going into play for why they're raising the rent, you know, what are they going to do to justify that, like um, making the, you know, the shared areas better um, and things of that nature. Um, and then after that first informal meeting, if they can't come to an agreement, um, they can then request mediation before the uh, Department of Business and Professional Regulation. Um, and then finally, if they can't reach um, a, a settlement at that point, they can go ahead and, and file suit um, and they, the homeowners association can, can go ahead and be the main plaintiff. Um, and then one thing which I'll talk about in a little more detail later um, is that Florida, the chapter 723 um, uh, requires the proposed lot rent increase to be a reasonable increase. This is distinct from the Landlord Tenant Act, which doesn't have any such provision saying, so, so basically if um, you're in this landlord tenant relationship, they can raise the rent you know, to, to whatever they want. But um, if you're under chapter 723, the lot rent needs to be reasonable. Um, and typically uh, courts are gonna look to uh, what the market rate is. Uh, to make that determination, as well as you know, just uh, what what you know what other folks are charging in the area, um, and what amenities that park is providing. Yeah. Mayor Rose, can I speak to this for a second? Of course. And I don't know too. I know we have a myriad of, of advocates in the background too, from different backgrounds, um, both legal, non-legal. This is probably one of the largest issues in legal services in North Florida we're seeing consistently. Mm -hmm. And I know that you probably speak to this, which has been uh, kind of in the midst of the pandemic, 
we're seeing an unreasonable amount of rental increases all throughout North Florida. Mm -hmm. And so this is one of the areas where it's really helpful to have that collective bargaining power, as Mary Rose will speak to a little bit more in, in some of our um, case studies that we want to work out with y'all. But this is one of the things we're seeing again and again. Um, and so it's helpful to understand that delineation of, is this the type of home that's going to fall under a Chapter 723 statute scenario or 10 or more um, lots on this property versus Chapter 83? Because from just a strategy standpoint of how do you deal with this specific increase, it's going to be different in each instance. And so really working that out at the outset of a case um, can save you a lot of time and headaches and kind of give you the tools of what you're going to need. Um, and so I appreciate Mary Rose speaking to that a little bit more, mm -hmm. and we'll work that out with you guys in a case study in a few. Oops, did I just skip the next one? <laughs> All righty, um, so how can my client be evicted from the mobile home park? Um, there, uh, the statutes enumerate the ways, of course, the, the most common that we see is uh, they fall behind on lot rent. Um, another is you violate your rental agreement or the park's rules and regulations. Um, there's also one where the, the park changes the way the park's land is used. This does require six months notice from the park owner. Um, and then additionally, if you're a homeowner living in a park um, where there's a, a, an impending change of use, um, there is this Florida Mobile Home Relo Relocation Trust Fund, which can help offset some of those um, bills for relocation, which can be upwards of $10,000 to actually go ahead and move that mobile home uh, to another park. Um, and then finally, if you're convicted of a crime that impacts the health or safety of the park, um, and there's a, a lot of case law about that to determine, you know, what, what impacts the health and safety of the park. Um, for these, just briefly, I mean, for non-payment of lot rent, the landlord needs to give a five-day notice. Um, and then when you have evictions for cause, like if they're alleging you violated the lease agreement or a park rule or regulation, they need to give you a seven day notice um, regarding that issue um, to go ahead and fix that um, or, or not, depending on the, the severity of the alleged infraction. Um, so I'll go ahead. Oh, well, and then what happens to my client's mobile home um, if she's evicted? Uh, it depends. Um, she should be able to take the mobile home with her unless the landlord um, has some sort of lien on the home. Um, and that could be from, you know, unpaid court costs um, for if they had to litigate and if there was, you know, an eviction um, and, and things of that nature. So you would have to look to see if there's a lien uh, on the home before moving it out of the park. So um, here's just a list of some common problems that your client may face. A big one is um, misrepresentation regarding the sale or the financing of the mobile home. Um, another is defects in the manufacturing or the installation of the home, um, poor maintenance in, in shared areas that is meant to be the responsibility of the landlord and the landlord doesn't meet those duties uh, to fix those, uh, those shared areas. Um, again, we alluded to that, but the arbitrary and unreasonable increases in lot rent, um, fines that are being exacted, but that are not provided for in the lease agreement. Um, the mobile home is too old or in poor repair. Um, and in fact, um, if your home is, I think it's, um, if it was manufactured 1976 or before, um, you cannot move the home unless you get a special dispensation. Um, and even if it was um, manufactured later than 1976, we see a lot of them that are manufactured in the 90s to 2000s, they can still be so dilapidated and derelict that it can be really difficult uh, to actually move that. Um, so that's why we say that uh, mobile home is a bit of a misnomer because it really depends on uh, you know, the, the age of, of the home. Um, you know, again, uh, large costs associated with moving parks, like I said, upwards of $10,000. Um, and then, of course, living in Florida, we know that mobile homes are more prone to damage when we're talking about uh, natural disasters. So those are just some um, issue spotting to keep in mind. Of course, these are all very complex legal issues. So when in doubt, you should just refer to your local legal aid. Yeah, and then even on lsnf.org, we have training. So from a disaster standpoint, 
because we're dealing with Northwest Florida here, we've unfortunately seen far too many hurricanes. Mm -hmm. And so we've done a lot of trainings regarding both home ownership protections and landlord tenant concerns that would apply to mobile homes for these areas too. Um, the other thing I can say, dealing with this from a perspective of, being, of how to protect our more senior adults in our communities, we see a lot of repeat contracts, right? And because sometimes these mobile homes might have informal financing agreements. So, uh, and we'll talk about rent to own in a few, but what you might see is just for uh, one of the common problems that you see face for clients that own a mobile home is numerous forms of, of contracts, both for the lot rent, they, and sometimes it can be confusing to understand what is the valid agreement they have and, and, and really what's in place. And so being able to just work that out with them is a, is a big help. Um, and so I think it, if there's any confusion on what is the prevailing contract, it's very helpful to consult legal counsel, especially working with the legal aid program if eligible, because it'd be great to be able to help them understand just their basic rights. Um, it can put them in a lot more of a secure housing position than not. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so if, you know, if you're working with someone as a senior citizen and they're considering purchasing a mobile home, just a few helpful tips, um, you know, you want to know, are they purchasing both the mobile home and the lot on which the mobile home sits, or are they only purchasing the home? Um, cause that's really going to be determinative in terms of, you know, their, the, um, their legal status. Um, if the client is only purchasing the home and not the land, client will need to pay lot rent each month to the park owner. Um, some things that uh, they should be providing uh, the, the um, mobile home purchaser are uh, the rules and regulation of the park, um, often called the park prospectus. That's going to be the most common word. Um, and you'll want to know, you know, is there already a mobile home association in place? You know, what are those bylaws of that corporation? Um, and then again, we just mentioned this, what year was the unit manufactured? Um, and then, you know, you want to make sure that your client is conducting due diligence, um, doing a lot of public records searches before purchase, and you can find out a lot of good information in the clerk of courts, you know, how many times has that landlord filed evictions over the past few years. Um, you can take a look at the property appraisers website. Uh, sunbiz.org, which will give you some idea about um, the, you know, what the, the landlord, the corporation, um, you can check with your local code enforcement to see how many uh, code enforcement violations there are. And then uh, you can take a look at um, uh, DHSMV and you can ask actually for the VIN number of the mobile home and call uh, DHSMV to check that the person or their company actually owns the home and that that title is clear. Um, so if you're calling, there's a few ways to purchase. You could purchase um, directly um, from, you know, from, from an individual owner who is, you know, is living there and now they wish to sell it. Um, you could purchase it through a mobile home dealer or often you'll pur purchase it from the park itself. Uh, if you're purchasing from a dealer, um, you know, just some more tips. You want to ask for names and addresses of prior customers. Um, you can check on uh, BBB to ask about the dealer, um, ask what their service policy are, uh, you know, what's the condition of the home on delivery? Will that be guaranteed? And will the dealer service it? Uh, I had a client recently who she understood that she was um, purchasing the home and that it would also be delivered and set up for her. Um, but it, it was not, that was not part of the contract. And so now she's living um, in sort of a shed that's not fit for habitation um, while she um, comes up with the money to um, get everything installed. Um, so it can be a difficult uh, situation. Um, and of course, again, hurricanes. So you wanna make sure that the model of the home, the manufactured home is, is built to sustain, you know, living in, in Florida. Um, so let's see, uh, the contract, you want to make sure that your client gets everything they agree to in writing, um, client and the seller, um, should always sign a contract that lists, yeah, you know, the price, how will the client pay, uh, whether there's a warranty, you know, is that, uh, express or implied and the consequences for either side for not complying with the contract. 
Um, and Gia will speak more about rent to owns here in just a moment. Um, but if the client entered into a so-called rent to own agreement, it needs to be in writing. Uh, it should specify which party is responsible for making those repairs before the title is transferred to the purchaser. And also just what factors need to be met in order to finalize that, that title transfer. Um, and I, again, it's important to follow up with DHSMV to make sure that the title is actually transferred and that they didn't just say they were transferring it. Um, and I think we're wrapping up 723 here. Um, you know, does the owner of the mobile home park have obligations to the residents of the park? I think I mentioned this briefly. Um, you know, they need to be complying with housing codes, uh, which often they don't. Um, maintaining, you know, these common areas. Um, providing access to the common areas and, uh, you know, unless the park prospectus states otherwise, they need to be maintaining the utility connections, substance for to park owners responsible uh, in proper operating conditions. Yeah, I, I will say to this line too, just because an, a park owner has an obligation to make, maintain these areas of the park does not mean that that's a blank check for a homeowner then to come along and try to enter into any of the individual residents' homes individually, right? Chapter 723 is pretty explicit about that. While they can come on to the, the actual lot for issues of safety or concerns regarding utility connections, um, it's just very important to let our, our, our adult seniors know, hey, that does not mean they have to allow a property manager on site or their landlord to have a free opportunity to come in and out of their home at any time or day. Um, this is something, unfortunately, we see some confusion over at times. And so I just want to make clear the uh, chapter 723 is pretty explicit about that. Um, the ability for individuals that own their own mobile homes not have to worry about being subject to terrible inspection when it's their home and their time. Uh, and, and just because they're on the lot doesn't mean it's a, uh, a free pass or free opportunity for mobile park owners. So just something to keep in mind, both for the safety and just the privacy and well-being of uh, any of your individuals that are, are owning these homes. Yeah, absolutely. All right, and I think we're coming to our case study number one, chapter 723. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about something um, that happened in our service area. Um, so an out-of-state developer purchased a mobile home park um, in uh, LSNF service area. It's in one of the poor zip codes in Florida. And they ended up um, sending residents uh, a 90-day notice that their rent would be increased from around $400 to $900. So of course, we're talking over, you know, over twice what they had been paying. Um, every single one of our clients who was on the homeowners committee uh, were senior citizens on a fixed income. So, of course, they couldn't fathom, um, you know, this kind of increase in, in their monthly costs. Um, and they were, they were, frankly, they were terrified. Um, and so we went ahead, we got the homeowners committee formed, um, and then we requested that informal meeting uh, with, the, with the park owner um, so that they could kind of justify um, you know, how can you increase from 400 to 900? Of course, there's, they couldn't justify it and they just look to, you know, market rent. And of course we're seeing um, this um, inflation in, in, in rent prices, but that was the only thing that they, um, you know, the only leg they had to stand on. So luckily, um, you know, with the help of the, of the homeowners, um, we sat down and we were able to get um, that uh, increase uh, just from uh, from 400 to around 550. Um, so we only saw about a hundred and fifty dollar increase um, as opposed to a five hundred dollar increase. So of course, no increase would have been better, um, but this was you know a, a compromise that that our clients could live with. Um, and again, this process would not have been possible if there weren't more than ten homeowners at the park. Um, because if there had been less, um, then Chapter 83 would have applied uh, the, of the Landlord Tenant Act, and the Landlord Tenant Act does not have that corresponding uh, provision uh, saying that um, rent increases must be reasonable. Um, but here, because we had the you know um, 10 plus owners, I think we had something like uh, 
30, um, we were able to to negotiate that that down. So that was that was a you know a good success story. Um, uh, real quick, so I know if you all have any questions all throughout, please feel free to enter them into a chat at this time. Uh, I just wanted to share so to uh, toot Mary Rose's horn here for her, because she wouldn't do this. This is a big scenario that we're seeing on the increase here at Legal Services. And she's had to really take on um, a lot of land, new landowners and developers in town that are really trying to push through these provisions. And it's been a lot of hard work. Um, but I wanted to ask her to kind of elaborate on two aspects, Mary Rose, too. Mm -hmm. So from your perspective, Kind of what was it like and what was kind of your triage mindset when you got this 90 day notice mm -hmm. clients coming in multiple ones from the same park mm -hmm. what was it like to get the um, clients homeowners committee set up and how did you kind of go about that yeah so i had um sort of a point person she has a uh, you know a community organizer spirit and so she was able to um get folks together so we could go ahead. Um, the Department of Business and Professional Regulation has a form that allows you to get all the signatures um, so that you can then form that homeowners committee. Um, and we just had to have, you know, two thirds of the homeowners sign on saying that yes, um, these other homeowners could represent them in the negotiation process uh, with the landlord. Um, so, so forming it wasn't, wasn't too difficult, um, but again, you know, folks were terrified, so there were a lot of nerves, and, you know, really with this 90-day um, notice, I mean, that's, you know, that's no time at all, and so you have to work pretty quickly, act pretty quickly. Um, so I will say, you know, our homeowners there were in a, were in a much better position. Um, but that we also had um, tons of clients there uh, who did not own the home. They rented both the lot in the home. And so they were in uh, much more of a pickle because what this landlord was saying is, as soon as your lease agreement expires, um, you need to go ahead and get out. Um, and so there were folks um, who had lease agreements, and then there were also a ton of folks who were just month to month, um, and they were really um, in, in dire straits. Um, so something uh, wonderful was that the community kind of got involved, and there was a lot of press surrounding this, and there was a lot of money raised for those um, relocation uh, funds. Um, so the community really rallied to, to help these people. Um, and, and, and these clients really were able to advocate for themselves and to say, you know, we're senior citizens, we did not work all of our lives, raise our children, you know, live in this community to be treated like this. Um, so it was really um, all, you know, all thanks to them, so. Yeah, I can say that's a tricky thing for uh, those that are attorneys, right? We do have the provisions and the rule, uh, rules regulating the Florida Bar that doesn't permit us to be able to go door to door knocking or soliciting you, right? And so one of the things that Mary Rose did that was quite effective was kind of take an accounting of who are those community partners in the area, right? Were the schools who are the other um, organizations or the county or city officials that have come and contacted us about these things? And then kind of, she was able to put together a plan both in their communication of, of how she was gonna connect these tenants and their needs and then who would be the different avenues, you know, what are the different avenues of relief through the committee? Mm -hmm. um, I do know one sticking point, Mary Rose, is you had brought up, and some of these properties we're seeing, you know, you'll see sometimes double the rent coming through at this time in the midst of the pandemic with really not a lot happening at these properties. So it's not as if they're building beautiful new, uh, making new structures in the common areas, right? Adding maybe a, a community pool or a different mm, fencing no. or safety <laughs> or security. It's kind of, you know, some of these places have been there for over two or three decades. Mm -hmm. People have lived there that long and now you have a double rent. So yeah. can you maybe speak to please, what were some of the determinative factors regarding that unreasonable rental agreement and the cases that you've seen in general and how are you able to kind of help in those negotiations, either at mediation mm -hmm. or, um, you know, with the committee or on behalf of clients individually, what are the, some of the things that you've been noticing about unreasonable rent amounts and that might be helpful for those that have clients that are considering yeah. um, these concerns? Yeah, absolutely. And Gio is right. And that's something I wanted to mention. I mean, some of these folks in our, our committee, I mean, I had one person who has been living there for 35 years. Um, and so it's, you know, that's, that is their home and they don't want to move. Um, in terms of, you know, regarding reasonable lot rent, I mean, when we approached them, 
uh, you, well, technically the landlord is supposed to provide a market study, uh, but they did not, um, but we did have a law clerk uh, calling around to the um, various mobile home parks in the area to see, uh, you know, what they're charging for lot rent, and it was um, much less than what these uh, folks were proposing to charge. And two, as, as Gio alluded to, we looked to, you know, what what are you going to provide? What, how can you justify this $500 increase? What kinds of um, you know, community services are you gonna build? Are you going to fix the pool? Are you going to fix these fences? Are you gonna keep their lawns up? Um, you know, what, what improvements are you gonna make? And of course, you know, the answer here was nothing or they, they, hadn't, they, they had a lot of promises, but they had no plans, no concrete plans. Um, so that um, and the market rent I think are, are really the, 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 the two factors uh, to look to. No, it's good. And can you maybe lastly, and I see one question in the chat that was brought up, um, mm -hmm. but how, how, how did you actually get the community involved then? What did that look like? I know there was, um, from your perspective, you have a bunch of applicants coming over to legal services. They're concerned they've got these 90 day no notices. Absolutely. So what did that look like getting community engagement and, uh, and maybe any tips you might have for individuals on how they might be able to help in similar circumstances? Yeah, well, the way we heard about this particular park was actually from the, the elementary school that's zoned for this area. And they called us up and they said, look, we have, um, it was something insane, like a, like uh, two thirds or a third of their student population was living at this um, park, which is just, um, the, it's walking distance. And they said, you know, all our, our parents are terrified, you know, what can you do to help? So that um, school was a wonderful partner um, and they, you know, hosted a legal clinic for us. Um, and then we also connected, you know, with the local school board, um, city and county commissioners, of course, being legal services, we can't advocate for policy, but we can, you know, um, connect with with these types of individuals. Um, and then just looking to, you know, um, social service programs, mm -hmm. um, you know, places, I think Catholic Charities is nationwide and certainly statewide. Um, and we, you know, we have uh, other programs here in our service area that um, provide rental assistance during mm -hmm. the pandemic. Um, and also um, uh, the housing authority um, uh, was able to get involved and they provided, um, they issued something like 40 emergency vouch vouchers to help these people uh, with relocation. So um, if this is happening in your community, it, it wouldn't hurt to contact your local housing authority to see if they would issue um, some emergency vouchers to get these folks located, relocated. No, that's great. And that's the, I think the one great takeaway I would, if, if you hear from Mary Rose's perspective and her story, one great thing that she did is she recognized what are the both litigation strategies or tactics you can take, but also what are the uh, maybe the non-legal remedies or recourse, because sometimes that might be quicker or more effective. And so because you have in the midst of COVID right now, so much emergency rental assistance funds available, um, uh, we previously had them through the Florida's Department of Children and Families, uh, those applications period just ended, um, unfortunately, in May, but they still have a lot of applicants out in our community who may have requested those funds, as well as state and local authorities and other nonprofit organizations in our communities have emergency rental assistance programs. So uh, coordinating clinics, legal clinics, or coordinating outreach with, in partnership with these organizations can meet kind of the full gamut of their needs. So you can get them set up with rental assistance, to help them financially transition from an increase in rent, um, as well as being able to then kind of um, legally meet their needs, look through all their letters and documentations, make sure what notices they've gotten. It's kind of providing a holistic support to some of these clients to make sure um, that not only that they understand their legal scenario, what are they facing, but financially too, if, uh, by all means, if they have the support from the community to be able to do so. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. And it was beautiful to see the community rally around these folks and say, we're not going to accept this type of predatory behavior in our community. And really a nonprofit set up a GoFundMe and there was about within two or three days, they had raised like $25,000 for these folks. So it was really wonderful. That's awesome. That's mm -hmm. awesome. So um, I think we're going to get into the landlord tenant gap now. Great, great. Yeah. So if you have any questions, please feel free to send them in the chat. 
Um, and so uh, my goal is to look through kind of the next step of the process, right? What happens if you're not going to fall under Chapter 723, right? We have some mobile home lots that are maybe, you know, under 10 lots, nine or below. Or we have instances too when maybe someone's renting both the home and the lot, right? They're not a homeowner in and of themselves. Then this is going to be a Chapter 83 scenario. So I want to be able to make clear we had uh, Jeff Hearn who does wonderful work on Florida Landlord Tenant Law. You can see so many of his trainings online too, I think through Legal Services of Greater Miami as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, so I also want to refer you also to his training regarding the unlawful detainers as well. Uh, our goal is not really to try to uh, duplicate any of those things, but we're going to kind of take it from the perspective of mobile homes and, and how to deal with renting mobile homes specifically because they're an unusual creature under law. Like Mary Rose brought this up, but it's kind of a misnomer to call them mobile homes because they're hard to move. Mm -hmm. So many of the homes we're seeing in our, our, our scene are three to four decades old. It's not as if our client has the ability to easily move them. And then on top of that, because they're hooked up to utilities and electrical and water, and, and they might even have other forms of structures connected to them, to actually go ahead and take the time to um, make preparations to move a mobile home and to be able to afford a removal can be quite lengthy and expensive. So... That's one of the things you want to look at then are what are some strategies of how to handle Florida's Landlord Tenant Act when it comes to mobile homes for individuals that, hey, maybe they set up this place or they're renting this place with the ex expectation of living there for a long time, you know, or, or maybe they might have a rent to own agreement. So if you have any questions about that as we're talking, please feel free to put them in the chat and um, we'd love to get connected. But um, looking to chapter 83, what why is chapter 83 special? What does that have to do? Well, first off, you need to know chapter 83 is not the only way for a land owner or mobile home owner to try to evict a tenant that is renting that mobile home, right? There are other ways that Florida law permits individuals who own a property to try to get possession of their property back, right? And, and so this perspective of our presentation is really going to be from the perspective of tenants based mm -hmm. or purchasers based. There are instances where we get calls from our organizations from maybe mom and pop owners that need help. And so they can look to these statutes as well. We, we really won't be explaining a lot of that process from a landlord's perspective, but you can find resources online. But I want to explain kind of the three quick ways that we see um, maybe elders in our community need protections from these possession, um, these possession actions. So the first one that a landowner might do is a chapter 83 eviction, which we're going to look, look at in detail. The key words, the key thing to keep in mind is there has to be a landlord tenant relationship. All right. And so we're going to explain what that means in a second, but landlord tenant relationship, normally it's going to mean a lease of some form, right? There has to be some sort of agreement between the parties that there's going to be money paid, rent conferred, or in some extraordinary circumstances, services on the regular, a said set of services in lieu of funds paid to for a set period of time. Uh, another one, though, that we see often is Chapter 66, which that's the ejectment actions. This is an unusual one. So where Chapter 83 in eviction is really a quick thing that happens. In fact, the fact Florida law says it's an accelerated proceeding. It goes very fast. Chapter 66 is not, this is going to go to a circuit court where, where you're dealing with property issues. This is really a, a, an unfortunate scenario where we see individuals who maybe were living at a home for a period of time, uh, were given uh, some sort of agreement to be there. They didn't have a lease. They weren't really paying funds, but they were there, especially in the middle of the pandemic. We have seniors that were welcomed into homes. And then for whatever reason, that homeowner then has reached disagreement or they're removing the ability for that individual to be on the property. And so Florida law says if anyone has legal title to that property, they can kick someone who does not have legal title on that property out by way of a chapter 66. And that means anyone who has less of a right under the law, which normally just means you have to have some sort of title, some sort of ownership interest in that property. Um, Chapter 82 is even faster. This is uh, unlawful detainer action. It's very similar to evictions. And so I know um, that uh, Jeff Hearn had spoken to this specific statute 
and will provide some explanations of the protections. The thing you just need to know is this tends to be the case where you have individuals uh, being removed from the home who have no owner interest in the property whatsoever. So an ejectment uh, might be a, a scenario where someone once had an ability to be in the property, or maybe they had some sort of interest, a minute one, but someone with a uh, superior title to that property, more of an ownership interest is coming through and saying you need to go. Mm -hmm. And where we see chapter 66 a lot here at Legal Services of North Florida are tax deed sales. We, I can't tell you how many times we see widows, unfortunately, where we've had a couple of scenarios where husbands have passed away and maybe the family unit together were helping everyone pay the taxes on properties, on mobile homes. And unfortunately, when they don't pay, then the, that tax deed goes up for a sale and you'll see a for sale on the property a lot of times. And so sometimes this will happen. We've had, uh, unfortunately, clients not even aware that they've lost their home, that they're no longer the owner anymore through a tax deed sale. And then you'll see, we find out a lot of times because there's been an ejectment action filed. So we have, uh, unfortunately, widows who have paid on this property for, on their properties for years, and this happens, and they've got to figure out what to do, how to protect themselves or what's happening. So this is why it's really important to understand whenever you have individuals coming to you, what, what is their ownership interest in that property? And so I know Mary Rose did a great job of listing out whenever you have individuals that come to you with the need of places to look on the property for such as, you know, even something as simple as a Google search, right? That's basic, makes sense, but you can look into all this information of the landowners. But if you have an individual that does own a mobile home and they come to you with a concern, two of the most basic places you can look at, it's just gonna be the tax collector's office. Mm -hmm. Have the property taxes been paid? I know sometimes it's not at the forefront of our mind, but it's important to know because you don't want to see someone who's invested so much time and money into a place lose it through a tax deed sale. And then the second one is also looking at um, the uh, real estate appraiser's office for the county you're at. So looking at that appraisal's office is helpful because as we're about to go under Chapter 83 Florida statutes, and I'm going to explain evictions to you, one of the key things in an eviction, as we said, it's landlord tenant relationship well that landlord according to florida law needs to be the owner of that property well how do you find that out sometimes for mobile homes and uh, the mobile homes if the mobile home and the land are owned by the same entity a lot of times you'll see that that person can with the word that we use is just retire the mobile home at the property where it's all deeded as one online and so it's hard to know when does that happen or has that occurred checking the property appraiser's website for your county for that property can help you understand. Does it show up as a vacant lot? Does it show that it's been improved with the mobile home? Looking through those documents are going to be very important so you understand what's going on. For the purposes of Chapter 83, if you go on that website and found out that the mobile home owner and the owner of the lot is um, not the name of the person who's filed an eviction lawsuit against that entity, there may not be the ability for a, a county court to hear an eviction at all. The, and that happens more often than you would think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But what I mean, our technical phrase we use for it is subject matter jurisdiction. Simply put, for in non legalese, it just means this court can't hear this case because the landlord, uh, the person who filed the case, is not the landlord. The landlord has to do that. And so that means the owner, according to um, the, the real estate appraiser's office and or who might be there as well in the DMV information regarding the title of the mobile home. So it's important to check those things before you move on. But let's say for, for the, our discussion today um, that it is the right person, right? The person who does own the land is bringing eviction action. What does that look like? Well, the hallmark of evictions under chapter 83 is gonna be this landlord-tenant relationship. And it simply just means there's a lease agreement, right? It's a rental agreement. It could be either in writing or orally. Now, what we have all too often is we we're told by clients in the community, I don't have a lease. And what they normally mean is I don't have a written agreement. But the way the law works is it assumes that if there's nothing in writing, then we kind of look at the duration of that lease agreement is going to be based upon when do you pay? So that's immediately the question I asked. Okay, if you don't have anything in writing, uh, do you pay anything? And how often? If it's weekly, then you've got a weekly, uh, you can have a, 
a weekly lease agree, uh, agreement in place. If it's you pay once a month, it's a month to month agreement. If you pay, uh, you know, uh, beyond that too, you can even have as long as an annual lease agreement is set up too. For each of those agree, uh, types of agreements, it's important to know what that duration is because the Florida law puts in protections for you. The key protection that we're gonna look at here in a se second is in order for any sort of eviction to be filed, there has to be a notice given to that tenant, that person on that property, they need to be notified that eviction is going to happen. Why is that? Well, they've got a lease agreement. It's a contract under the law. And so if a landowner wants to rip up that contract and say, hey, we're terminating this contract agreement and you've got to get out of here, they can't do that without giving a proper notice under the law first. And so this, that's when we talk about evictions. You hear that phrase all the time, I'm being evicted. And it's very important to be very careful in the language we use. So at Legal Services, we always ask our, our, one of the first questions is, okay, you're being evicted. Did you get a notice document that you have to either pay or that they're terminating your lease? And then if the answer is yes there, then we start moving forward to say, has a lawsuit been filed against you? And then the final step of the eviction is there has to be some sort of judgment. It's not enough that a lawsuit's been filed. A judge has to be able to stamp off and say, you know what, actually, you should have paid or you did violate the lease agreement somehow. And so you are, there is a judgment. If this has occurred, and you'll, we, you can look on legal services, uh, lsnf.org or for more details. If this has occurred, you'll see then the final step is there's a 24-hour writ of possession. That's just a document that gets served upon a tenant, unfortunately, that says you have 24 hours to leave this property or vacate. But none of that can happen. That whole process doesn't happen unless there's a notice given at the very start of everything that says this is why we are terminating your lease agreement. So let's talk about that. What does that look like? Well, there's four different types of notices that are going to be given to tenants. Um, they're all based on the different circumstances. Florida law works quick on evictions. If you look at us compared to other states, unfortunately, we are one of the quickest eviction labs. Is it through Princeton or Yale? Is it set in? I'm not sure, yeah. It's one of the wonderful Ivy League schools um, <laughs> has set up I, the eviction labs is where you can actually look. They have a, a formal process of being able to verify the state of evictions all throughout the U.S., not only through the pandemic have they been monitoring amounts, uh, but they also look at eviction processes. And Florida ranked pretty bad as far as the speed of having tenants out of a home. You have a three-day notice given for non-payment. And what that means is uh, if someone doesn't pay their rent, they've only got three days to pay it. So we're going to look at that in a second. What does that mean before an eviction starts? Another type of notice is a notice for cause. Um, so a seven-day notice uh, will be given is we're terminating your lease for cause, but you can have that option to either cure the cause and fix the problem, or in some instances, unfortunately, it's such a gross violation that there is no cure that can be given. You just have seven days to go. The other thing that we see is normally a 15-day notice. It's a 15-day notice is normally given when they're terminating the lease. This can either come, you'll see this type of notice. A month to month lease. A month to month lease, mm -hmm. that's right. Mm -hmm. you can, that 15 days would be a longer requirement if that lease is longer. An annual lease is going to require even more time from that too. Unless you can see within the lease agreement, you might also provide even additional time, such as 90 days and some written agreements. But the bare minimum of is if you have a month to month lease agreement, Oh, really, only the landlord has to provide 15 days before the end of the month um, or when rent is due next, 15 days prior, a notice that they're going to file an eviction and that they're terminating the lease agreement. Um, and that only gives a, a tenant 15 days to have to vacate the property, which is what we've seen a lot of right now yeah. when we have rent increases in our community. So let's look at them real quick. The three-day notice is that and we call this the quit or pay scenario. And this is a big concern. If a tenant has not paid rent, then a landlord only has to give a three-day notice in writing to a tenant to vacate the premises or pay the amount that's demanded, right? So you can look more clearly on the language that's required in this notice 
Chapter 83.56, Florida statutes uh, list it very clearly. But with that three day, it does not include weekends or holidays. So especially as we come into the summer months, it's helpful to calculate. And it also doesn't include the day that that notice was served on someone, right? So day one starts the day following the date of service, okay? Now, the thing is, if a landlord hasn't followed through and given this proper notice, there could be a helpful defense regarding improper notice, right? You can't file the lawsuit unless you give a proper three-day notice here. What we see some big failures here are property managers try to file this notice. When, if you look at the statutory language, it says a, a landlord has to be the one that files. Another thing is we see the dates are wrong. You'll see sometimes they'll file it and they'll say pay within three days. Maybe they'll get the notice on the 10th of the month and they'll say pay by the 11th or the 12th. You think, well, that's not three days. Another thing is it might not list the amount that's due or owed. So you can't tell someone to pay and then hide the ball from them and not tell them what they owe. And that's a big thing that we see sometimes uh, as well. That improper amounts are listed there too. And they're just made up out of nowhere. And so it's very helpful to keep this documentation of the notice and, and try to work with the clients to see what this might be. In any eviction action, there should be a copy of this notice if it's for a non-payment of rent needs to be attached to whatever complaint is being filed so you should be able to in the state of florida see one of those copies mm -hmm. right. and just to clarify this is just uh, again chapter 83 landlord tenant if um, it's a mobile home owner and they've fallen behind on their lot rent it's going to be a five-day notice uh, to, to to move or pay so very similar here that's great um, these days are all important too, and the timing are equally important too. I mean, we talked about this before, but in month to month rent agreements, the landlord only has to give a 15 day notice before the end of the month or when the next bit of money is due um, to vacate the premises. There is no pay. And this is the, the unfortunate scenario we see. Florida law does not require landlords to have to sign and negotiate a new rent agreement with anyone. You can't force people into contracts. And so this is the tragic scenario we're seeing because there's not enough housing stock in our communities, affordable housing. We have so many clients calling saying, hey, I'm at the end of my lease and they won't renew. And what do I do? And so if, if you see this happening, especially in some of our senior uh, seniors um, in town, some of the senior residencies that we have are at capacity, there's huge waiting lists. And then if for any reason they're trying to not find the grounds to be able to renew a lease, it's re you really need to try to verify the nature of that agreement. Is there maybe a public housing or tax credit portion to that agreement where they're supposed to renew? Or if not, if there's nothing but just a fair market rent value, then it can be really tricky. And so sometimes trying to communicate with that individual and then work with them to maybe speak to that property manager, that landlord helps, mm -hmm. even to buy more time than 15 days too. Mm -hmm. um, and just to bring it back to the mobile home again, um, you know, these, um, if, if you are renting both the lot and the home, uh, these month to month agree agreements are possible. However, if you're dealing with a mobile home owner, mm -hmm. you cannot have a month to month lease. It has to be um, renewed annually. Um, so that's something that we see um, is there'll be homeowners and, and um, the landlord will say, well, no, you're, you're on this month to month lease agreement. So we only have to give you 15 days. That's not going to cut it. And that's because, you know, it takes so much um, money and labor to, to go ahead and move that home from the property. And so you need more than 15 days. Of course, you need more than 15 days um, otherwise, but that's how the statute is written. So that's right. You know, that's great for, for being able to explain. That's this is one of the reasons why we brought up at the outset. You need to know is it 723 or chapter 83 that's going to apply. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now under if you are renting the mobile home, what we see often it has to be 15 days prior to rent being due. If you do see that it's beforehand, and we've been successful being able to tell landlords, mm -mm, it's not gonna cut it, you need to provide a new notice and that can buy some time. But if that's the case, you need to be able to speak with those tenants to be prepared to pay that month if possible. They're still on the property. They're receiving that benefit of being there. You've gotta negotiate, which can be tricky sometimes because they might be needing those funds to move out to the next place. Mm -hmm. So sometimes being able to, to agree to a different move out date is helpful in writing.
maybe say we'll do it mid-month and we only have to pay half. You know, these are the areas, these are called the non-legal remedies sometimes that might be better given the circumstances of your clients. Right, right. Um, now, once that time has elapsed, so after the 15 days, the landlord can, they are permitted to file an eviction action in the county court. Um, annual leases, as we brought up before, is a minimum of 60-day notice unless it's otherwise specified to. Um, so that's, that's really when you have a termination of lease. The last type that you're going to see is a, a seven-day notice under Chapter 83. All you need to know, whenever you think of the phrase seven day, you need to think of uh, uh, termination for cause. Mary Rose has a, a terribly cheesy joke. She says, it can't just be because I want you gone. And, but cause means something under the statute, right? There's a reason why you're terminating the lease. If you think of it, you've got a written contract. You can't just rip up the contract whenever you want. There has to be grounds and Florida law provides that. So we're going to look first at maybe if you have some sort of violation or breach of the lease, but if it's minor and it can be cured. So if a tenant who's violating the lease, if they could re remedy that issue within seven days, they can fix it. Some of these, uh, the statute's pretty clear on their examples, which is nice. It, it helps to explain what it might be. One might be having an unauthorized pet in the property or guest or parking scenarios. What the landlord has to do though, is they can't say, well, you're out of here. You need to go ahead and give um, a seven day notice with the opportunity to cure. If that um, tenant is able to cure that within the seven days and bring in a compliance, they're good to go. If they have not, then they, there could be an issue that the landlord could file an eviction. Now, if the, if the landlord does um, find that, you know what, the tenant fixed this, the dog is gone, or the parking scenario is fixed within seven days, the tenant still needs to be careful because they can't have the same conduct or similar conduct repeated within a 12 month period. And so this is tricky. You know, we do see some mobile home um, tenants kind of walking on eggshells with their landlord. And the biggest thing to verify is really is whatever they, the alleged violation, is it really an actual breach of the lease agreement or not? So you can provide some clarity. Um, the other one we see is opportunities where there is no cure. And these are unfortunate, um, they don't happen often, but this could be due to the tenant's willful destruction or damage or misuse of the property um, and, and other issues related to that. In those instances, it's, it is a seven day notice to have to leave the property um, due to the major non-compliance. And then an eviction action could start, could be filed in court if that doesn't occur too. So if you look at the statute, that's pretty clear on, on, on what the differences between these minor violations that can be cured are and some of these larger infractions that unfortunately there is not that ability to repair. I'm going to quickly leave, uh, go through this. This is just one simple process of chapter 83 provides of what happens if you're on the property, you're renting a mobile home and it's just clearly defective. Well, chapter 83.51 provides all the requirements that a landlord has to do to keep the home in good repair. So just as chapter 723 has requirements for the lots and the common areas, if a landlord owns that mobile home and they're renting it to someone, they have to keep it in good repair. And one of the biggest things are building and housing and health codes. So to be able to look at that, it's helpful to get an inspector out there. I know it can be tricky, especially in our outlying counties during COVID, but there, you're going to want to be able to document what those concerns are. Now, also look at the lease agreement because a landlord might try to transfer some of their responsibilities to make good repairs under a lease agreement. So it's important that any tenant that sees this, they're familiar with what their duties and responsibility are. But ultimately, the basic concerns of habitability are under 8351. That means a landlord has a basic duty for some of these things, uh, some of these things. Uh, structures, roofs, steps, flooring. Um, making sure that there's hot water to some of these areas. So these are key. Now, another aspect of this is if a tenant is living in these conditions and they know and, and they're tired of paying rent to that landlord because they're not gonna do anything, they can't just stop paying rent. And a lot of times we even see maybe a text message or an email sent when the rent was stopped. They actually have to make steps to give a notice themselves a seven day notice that explains in writing the reason why the landlord's not followed through with the repairs. And then it has to be seven days before that rent is due. 
You also want to make sure that um, you provide additional time if it's sent by mail, as we indicated there. And the other thing, too, is the landlord needs to make sure, I'm sorry, a tenant needs to make sure that they're caught up with rent, if possible, too. Because you can't say, oh, I'm not going to pay you now when they do have rent that's been owed for a while. So we get a lot of clients with that. Our goal is to figure out how to use rental assistance to catch them up if possible. And then from there, figuring out how to give a seven day notice to that landlord of, hey, you need to make these repairs. If a landlord does uh, continue on these terrible actions, it's helpful to have that housing inspector come out and make an inspection report and you can share a copy there. You can attach it to that seven day notice as well too. And that way, the landlord may be inclined to fix things a little bit quicker if they've got that third party inspection report. So this will be included in the slides for you to see. But um, once that seven day notice is given, it might be a little bit fuel to the fire and that a landlord might be upset about receiving that and refuse to want to make repairs. Or they might just say, you know what, you didn't pay me, even though you gave me the notice saying you weren't going to pay me because of these reasons. They might try to follow through with an eviction at that point. And if that's the case, if you've given that notice, it helps because then that tenant in the mobile home can raise a retaliation defense. Florida law is pretty clear. If you look under chapter 83, it explains what retaliatory conduct is. And whenever a landlord tries to evict someone, a tenant in a mobile home, because the, te the tenant is saying, I won't pay you legally because of all these failed housing inspection reports and these health code violations, that landlord can't come through and try to evict that individual. It's considered a retaliatory in nature too. Um, and so that can be raised as a defense to the entire eviction too. We've had numerous cases where we've been able to protect against those in mobile homes specifically. Now, the big key I wanna say that the practitioners know to have for you is make sure that the tenant doesn't spend their money. If they give this seven day notice saying, I'm not gonna pay because of the repairs, you really need to make sure, certain to coach them through to keep those funds aside. Because once those repairs are made, they, may, they might need to go ahead and pay for that time period of when, which the, um, they were still in the home and the housing was brought to current standards. A lot of times it can be done within that seven days. Or if an eviction is filed at court, they might have to take those funds and pay into the court registry to be able to protect themselves. So you can look on at lsnf.org in our housing section. We talk a lot about what those requirements are to pay into a court registry for protection. But the simple thing to know is if you're not going to pay, don't spend those funds. Keep them aside. That way you're protected and you can make sure that that, um, that individual is aware and, and safe to go moving forward once you deal with their housing repair issues. The last issue I want to bring up to then what we see that Chapter 83 does not deal with is some sorts of rent to own contracts. If you look at chapter 8342, it explains if you've got a rent to own agreement, at a certain point, you're no longer just a tenant, you're now a part owner of that property. And so it says uh, right at the outset that chapter 83 is not going to apply. In other words, the Landlord Tenant Act doesn't apply to individuals who have a contract for sale under a unit or property, which is part of which the buyer has paid at least 12 months rent. So if you've had 12 months to order or one month's rent in a deposit of at least 5% of the purchase price. If this is the case, you no longer have an average tenant, you now have what we call an equitable owner of the property. It doesn't mean they have a title to that home and they can sell and buy it. It just means at this point, they have the an equitable ownership the law says that just means you can use and possess that property. That's simple. So it's very important. So if this happens, you see rent to own contracts, look at the dates on it. Ask those clients, how much have you paid? How long have you lived there? We have, unfortunately, scenarios where we've seen um, that come to be. We're going to talk about in one second, a rent to own kind of gone bad. And what you need to make sure is to say, you know what, if you paid over 12 months, you're no longer just an average tenant. You have some added protections. You're an equitable owner, a part owner, and you can't go through a normal chapter 83 eviction for non-payment. Instead, it's going to be a foreclosure proceedings under traditional foreclosure law that you would see in Florida courts, not a normal landlord tenant proceeding. I also wanna encourage you look to chapter 559 and part 10 of that actually has kind of thrown together quickly 
through the legislator, uh, rental purchase agreement um, rules and regulations. The two of the most important ones is it has the right for someone who is purchasing a home through a rental purchase agreement to get a formal accounting of how much is owed and how much is paid. It's not the purchaser's um, obligation to know that. It's the person selling the property to have receipts. And the other one is an ownership letter at the time of payoff. It's very helpful, especially in instances when trying to get title to a, to a rent to own. We've, we've seen that too. When do we know that payoff has occurred? Well, it's the duty of that owner to let the purchaser know, hey, you've reached it. You've reached a goal of payoff, and here's a letter documenting that under the statute. So there's some helpful tools and resources on that very small chapter there for y'all. So real quick, this is the last um, case study we want to talk about, Chapter 83, Florida Statute. Um, this is a simple one. This is uh, scenarios that we've seen more recently than not. We've had clients come in the day before um, uh, eviction hearings showing us rental purchase agreements that they've had. And looking at the dates, we realized, oh, wow, they have paid rent under a rental purchase agreement for years. Unbeknownst to them, sometimes they'll even sign subsequent eviction, I'm uh, sorry, subsequent lease agreements. And in one instance, we have a client, he had two other eviction cases brought against him that he was able to defend himself against and pay fees and costs for when he already signed, prior to that, a valid rental purchase agreement. So those other evictions should not have occurred. And so in those instances, when we see this first step first is we, we try to provide a cease and desist letter to any of the owners saying, hey, stop, stop trying to evict people under chapter 83. If they paid for over a year, they are an equitable owner. And second, give us a formal accounting of what's owed. And in a couple instances, we've been privileged to see these wonderful individuals have made all the payments due and owing. We've been able to get them a letter of their ownership interest in the property. And then what we've been able to do is, in other instances, file cases asking two things. One, if you've got a valid rental purchase agreement, you wanna file a declaratory action with the court where we've been able to file on behalf of, an, uh, of a purchaser saying, hey, the landowner and this purchaser have a valid rental purchase agreement, which payments have been made on and all the payments have been made. So we want the court to declare the validity of that agreement. And then step two, we ask for specific performance, which is, hey, because they met, met this agreement, you need to go ahead and uh, transfer title into the name of the purchaser. And so that's kind of the two-step approach we've been able to take. A lot of times, even providing letters to some landowners, letting them know, hey, this is uh, what we're going to do if, if you don't respond within 30 days has also allowed us to have non-legal remedies to be able to settle out of court in certain cases. Mm -hmm. um, but these are some of the, the typical um, case studies that we're seeing. This happens on the regular, but this is a great way to help some of our clients, especially those near retirement age, reach that goal for them of being able to have home ownership for the first time through informal agreements that just need to be cleaned up. They just need to understand their rights and we can set them back on track.